So we're still here after the sea attack uh, with uh, Will. And uh, so what do you think of planned obsolescence? So there's a lot of controversy about the conspiracy of planned obsolescence. So what's planned obsolescence? Uh, that's the idea that companies design their products that after three to five years, the product is gonna break, normally right after the warranty period. Uh, it's gonna break and then you're gonna have to go out and buy a new product. And I hear that all the time. I hear that from very intelligent people. Uh, very, very, you know, PhDs, I hear people saying, oh, of course, this is standard in industry. They design this way. They want you to be able to buy a new product every three to five years. It helps keep the economy going. Um, it's, it's an interesting concept. Um, the reality is very different from the, from, I guess, the, the concept. Um, uh, the reality is engineers never plan for obsolescence. Matter of fact, the goal of every design that's ever made is that it lasts forever. Um, so could we make it last forever? We can make them last a long, long time. But what happens is, and when I say a long, long time, I mean they could last for 50 to 100 years. The problem is consumers don't want to buy uh, an iPod that costs $10,000. They want an iPod that plays music, it's cool, it has a status symbol, and it costs as little as possible, but it still does what it does. So the, the push for designers is to design a functional product, uh, and what they normally do is they try to pick good quality, high voltage, and when I say high voltage, maybe it's supposed to run at five volts, so they make sure it runs at 12 volts, 24 volts, uh, that it lasts a long time. Um, and, and they look for all these parts and they design the product and they get the schematic and the, the, the layout, the PCB, and they make sure the product functionally does what it should do. They get it all the prototype, all the prototypes all done. And the prototype probably costs them 10 to 20,000 to build. Um, and after they get it all done, then they turn it over to purchasing people. And purchasing people are then going to go ahead and, and buy the volume. They're going to buy a million units to get the price down. But what always happens is they come back and they say to the designer, do I have to use this capacitor that's a 24 volt capacitor? Can't I use this capacitor that's a five volt capacitor? Because they're trying to get cheaper. This one group of the company is trying to get a cheaper price. And the engineer goes, well, it would work at that voltage, but really it'd be better to have this higher voltage to make it last longer. So the planner hears that and they, they go off and talk to some other manager and say, well, look, he said it would work. Okay, we'll, go, we'll, we'll change it, but we won't tell him. So they go ahead and change this part to some lower voltage. And then it goes off in production. They go into production, they find, oh, wow, it, you know, it, the total parts cost to build this whole entire thing costs us $149. Oh, wait, but we want to sell it for $149. Oh, no, how can we make it cheaper? So they think, okay, we need to make the bare minimum. They go and they start changing the design to make it the bare minimum to get it as cheap as possible to the consumer. So if it's too expensive, the consumer won't buy it. So what inadvertently starts to happen is obsolescence creeps into the design, not by plan, uh, not a group of uh, executives got together in a secret room to decide we're gonna screw the consumer by, uh, by making sure that it dies every five years. Uh, but it's because they try to make it cost effective so the consumer will buy the product that this happens is they buy, they get cheaper and cheaper parts. They tend to buy the parts that are only tested to work for five years versus parts that would, could actually have a, a twice the voltage level. Twice the voltage level means not that it won't last for five years. It'll probably last for 10 years or 15 years. So that's what the engineer's designed for but other groups in the company try to save money because that's what the consumer wants to purchase. So then it makes, it makes the quality go down. And so this is what causes what we call planned obsolescence. No one wants it. it. Turns out the person that wants it inadvertently is the consumer. If the consumer was willing to pay three to four times the price, the product could last 10 to 20 times longer. But no matter what anyone says, no one wants to pay an extra dollar for their product. And that's why Walmart and the uh, super stores and online shopping aren't going away. They're going to be here forever. The, the planned obsolescence problem is 
exploding, uh, accelerating with all these smartphones that people change so often now. And with Apple making so much money on devices that get outdated in two years. Well, now, so what you're actually talking about isn't planned obsolescence. You're talking about another social norm, or unfortunately, social abnorm, as I might want to say, in that they don't get outdated. The phone works great. It'll work for five to six years. What happens is we have marketing that comes out and says, what, you have an iPhone 4? Well, you know, the iPhone 5 does this. And they have these great commercials showing how the iPhone 5 is incredible, or the Galaxy 4 is incredible, or the Galaxy 5. The new uh, Galaxy series, you're going to be having what they call Power Mat or Key QI charging at Starbucks. Starbucks released, announced this last year, they're going to have wireless charging in all their Starbucks stations. And so at Starbucks, you can put your down your, your uh, phone and you can just charge it while you're in there working on your laptop. Now, they're gonna have, this is a marketing campaign. Did, did the phone you have currently, which doesn't support that, is it, is it bad? Is it obsolete? Does it not function? It functions just fine. But a social concept in your mind is, my buddy has the newer phone with the newer feature. I need to get that. Do you really need it? No, you don't really need it. No one even really needs a cell phone, but we have, we're, we've conditioned ourselves that these are things we need to have because that's what everyone else has. And it's funny because the Western culture tends to consider itself very individualistic, that we're not part of the group mass, but our culture has changed and that we're becoming part of the group mass, that if all my friends have X, I need to have X. And if I don't have X, I'm not as good of a person as all my friends are. And this is, this is a sad reflection on our our, um, our sense of well-being, that we're, we're basing ourselves based off of economic goods versus our inner feelings or our relationships, which is, covers a totally different topic. So, so then you say that the engineers designed for things to last forever, and uh, one of the things you've worked on for a long time, many years, is uh, documentation of stuff, right? And what is that? You're going to get me in trouble. You're going to get me in trouble here. It's a dangerous, dangerous path we're on. So IEEE, in my volunteer role, um, my volunteer role in IEEE, we look at developing new standards. And the goal of IEEE is advancing humanity through technology. Um, one of these standards is IEEE P 1874, which is a standard for XML documentation for repairability and redesign. And what does that basically mean? There's a growing movement around the world uh, by a lot of green, uh, conservative, libertarian, the Tea Party movements that say, hey, it's wrong for us to buy, to consume these products. And every three to five years or two years, we throw them away, uh, you know, because of the features or my screen cracked because I dropped it or my LED light stopped working or my USB plug doesn't work anymore. So I go to go buy a new one. And, and there's a big movement saying, well, instead of buying a new one, what if I put a document on the web or on a Kindle that shows you how to take it apart easily and repair it yourself? Which is it was, it's an idea that we had in American culture for centuries. In the 1800s, people would fix it themselves. Fathers would teach their sons how to fix the car, change the oil. But we've kind of lost this, um, this cultural heritage of teaching our youth. But this is coming back now in a new way where people are getting together, they're posting YouTube videos how to fix things, do plumbing, uh, to uh, fix their phones. And this standard 1874 helps that by having a standard of XML, that sounds like a big word, it's basically extensible markup language. Basically it's the web pages of how to put data on a Kindle or an iPad or an iPhone It says, when you write these documents, write it this way so we can use it on multiple products. So that you know, mobile, mobile devices can pull up these images and this content that helps you to take apart and re-put together these parts. 
and we can extend the life. We can extend the life from two years to 10 years to 20 years. Not only that, we can have these repair manuals and take these products that we don't want to use anymore and we can give them to nonprofit groups who can take these products, repair them to some level and give them maybe to people who can't afford cell phones or give them the countries that can't afford that technology. But the, the life of the product can continue and we can make our world a better place. But, so what does this do? What does it do if we, if we repair things? One, it, it, it saves our ecology. We're not throwing it into big waste piles and dump piles. And, and as you know, we've talked about this, there's a terrible, terrible aspect that no one wants to talk about in the green movement, and that's e-recycling. We take our, our TVs, our, our, our video players, we drop it off at an e-recycling plant, the e-recycling plant takes it, they package it up, they sell it to a larger group who sells it to a larger group and it ends up on large shipping containers um, uh, bound for Africa. And then they go to Africa and they dump these large shipping containers on the beach of Africa, different coastal areas, and then they pour gallons and gallons of sulfuric and all these terrible acids on the products and it just eats through the plastics and they burn them and gold and silver end up depositing in rivulets of, of river water with salt water and there are images on the web you can see of small children running through these 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 uh, this this mismatch of of rivers filled with sulfuric acid with burns on their legs as they reach down into the water to pull up pieces of gold and silver and other pieces to go sell up on the beach and these are our e-recycling e centers where in western nations we try to do the right thing but it's causing this destruction and then this and this terrible hurt and killing of, 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 of the youth of the planet but being able to repair and recycle and reuse, this is allows us to extend the life, to help our planet, to make it a green, better place. And that's the goal of IEEE in helping others. So, uh, why are you good at making documentation? What, where is, where's your background? Well, how, do, how is it to make this documentation that you're talking about, the XML? Uh, and you like working in documentation? I hate documentation. You do? Um, I hate it. I hate it, hate it, hate it. Um, uh, it's interesting going to school, uh, you know, and learning to write, and I thought, this really blows. When am I ever going to use this? Uh, and then as an engineer, having to write papers and things, I hated it. Um, but then it, it's interesting because it, it becomes a way for ex to express ideas. Of course, we can express ideas verbally to our friends and our family, but to actually put it into print, we put it, in, we write it down, and then we look at it and we go, well, wow, is that what I meant? It helps us refocus our ideas and put it down. I hate doing documentation, but if I can create a solution that helps someone else, then I'm helping them to make the world a better place or to make them better. And if they can write something down that I can use later, that's awesome. I mean, one of the things, especially in this economic climate at my house, uh, repairs, you know, repair the the toilet has a problem. There's a leak, and I freak out. I'm like, oh my gosh, there's a toilet, there's a toilet leak. This means I have to call a plumber. He's going to come out for $150. Oh, I don't know if I want to do that. Well, the glory of YouTube, I can go to YouTube and go water leak, and I can find 50 videos of nice people who all have these videos that show how to take apart the toilet and fix the thing. And I can look at that, and I can look at the video, and I can go to the the store and buy a you know ten dollar part, and I, I can rewatch the video forty times till I feel comfortable, and then I can go and do it and get it done. Then I have a self, I have a sense of self worth. I got it accomplished, you know. And then uh, you know my wife will say, "Good job, William." And it seems like a minor thing, but it's a boost to my ego. It's like, oh my gosh, I solved this and I saved one hundred and fifty dollars, and that helps boost my self worth to do more things. And it's funny because when people give up their time to do this, they probably don't realize how much they're helping other people. But when you look at the download views of these videos, you see that they're reaching out to people and sharing that advice 
is helping people. Now it's funny, people always have different views of, oh, that guy's crazy, I wouldn't have done it this repair this way, I should have done that repair that way. But in, in the mix of the entire thing, people are doing things to help others. And when you do it in that mode, uh, I think you know we're really creating a better sense of community, even if it's a virtual sense of community. So do I like writing documentation? I hate writing, writing documentation. But if I can write something that'll save person time, money, and make their life better, I'm willing to do it. Why not? You know, it makes the world a better place. So is it kind of like a Wikipedia of fixing everything? Or not really? It's not centralized. It's just uh, uh, guidelines of what the IEEE suggests to be the way to set it up so everybody can read it quickly and... Stuff. That's Find it. Stuff. I mean, you could do the interview. There's no need for me. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> and I mean that in a positive way. So, uh, absolutely. 1874 says when you write it up, do it this way so it can be displayed on devices easily. Um, the specs an open spec. It's open to anyone. They can go to www.omanual.com um, and they can look at the spec, and it's there. It's XML. We're creating a, uh, a tool. There's a, there's a spec called DITA, D-I-T-A. And D-I-T-A is uh, similar in use. Uh, and we have a, uh, we're, we're, we've um, hired a company to create a DITA to O-Manual conversion tool to change the XML from DITA format to O-Manual. So you can use this. It looks like, and I'm sure Kyle Wines, the CEO of iFixit, will kill me by saying this, but I, I think he may have mentioned in passing that Dell is looking at using this, the U.S. Army, the U.S. Navy, uh, a bunch of automotive companies looking at use, using this. And the funny thing is automotive companies and other companies want you to be able to repair your products. They, they don't want you to call them every 10 minutes and say, why can't I take this gasket off? Why do I have to do this thing? They want to make a, an open forum where people can share ideas and help each other. It helps their burden. They save money where they can focus on doing new developments to make their products better and last longer uh, versus spending a bunch of time helping people to, to help themselves in fixing their product. So it's a win-win for everyone. And the great thing about 1874 is it's being referenced in UL 110, it's being referenced in some UN uh, standards as well as ITU and ISO. So it looks like there's a growing green movement to provide standards to make our lives better and help the ecology and uh, the, to affect global warming by reducing CO2 emissions. So I think this is, is part of a whole package of standards that will make our lives better. So the next 5 billion people need, are going to get connected and uh, not necessarily through new devices but even if it is the point is, you don't want to throw out there five billion pieces of consumer electronics that just don't last, right? It's it's a big engineering challenge to design these devices in a way that's just, you know, there might not be enough metals for five, for ten billion devices. There's maybe only five. I mean, it's big, big, big thing. What's sure. going on here? Absolutely. And that's why we need to have these documents that allow us to repair and reuse. Uh, and, and even if we do want the newer phone with the newer feature, um, you know, we can pass that phone off to someone else who really can't afford it. Um, I know people who have five and ten unused cell phones in their desk drawer. They bought them for $400, their company bought them, whatever it was. They, they're a couple years old. They decided to get the, the newer, better feature set, and they're just sitting there. Uh, so why not take those and donate them to the Red Cross so the Red Cross can use them in an emergency search situation? Or why not donate them to the Goodwill or Salvation Army so they can give them to people that have lower income so they can use it for emergency calls or to be connected to their family or loved ones? Why not do that? It does, it's, not, it's not costing me or you anything. We've already paid for it. We already used, got the use out of it. It's just sitting in our drawer. We could throw it in the trash and then go sit in a landfill for another 150 years as it slowly decomposes and, and nasty chemicals leach out of it into our environment. Or we could extend the life of it by giving it to someone else who needs it, giving them, empower someone else with the information so they can do the repair themselves and, and not be beholden to corporations to you know, purchase new content every three to five years. So what does Apple, Samsung, and uh, AT&T, and I don't know who, who, what do they think about this? 
there's a dichotomy. And so when I say dichotomy, of course, I mean there's two opposing views. If you ask the corporate entity, the corporate entity of Apple, they'll tell you they're completely against this, you shouldn't use it, uh, the common person doesn't have the knowledge or the skill set to do this. Um, if you ask the individual employees of Apple, I have never met an individual employee of Apple that has ever said they didn't like this. Matter of fact, most of them are users themselves. They'd rather fix it themselves than send it off to someone for a week or two and have them, you know, them fix it. Uh, and this is the same with probably Samsung. Uh, but there's a shift because there's the, there's the aspect, I don't want you messing with my phone, jailbreaking my phone, making my phone do something that it shouldn't do versus Samsung, for example, has a whole t television line. They know that so occasionally they have problems and a person that bought a $4,000 TV doesn't want to hire an electrician for $150 an hour to muck around the back of the TV, uh, you know, uh, and they know there's a growing movement of people of self-helpers and do-it-yourselfers who are going out there getting information to do it. Companies like Dell are saying, Dell and Samsung are saying, hey, let's be involved with this. Let's put our content out there. And we'll say you use it as is, and this, you know, volunteer base um, like uh, there was that really incredible uh, website, I think it's been around for a while, called uh, Arcos Fan Base, I believe. That's a perfect example of, of, a, of a user forum that went to use a popular multimedia device uh, to extensively made it last longer and, and, and do more features that maybe the company didn't have time to do. Have Samsung, having put in this content for how to repair their TVs, pushes out them being responsible to do the repairs to the average user to empower them to do it. And of course, by doing that, that allows them to grow a sense of a fandom, a sense of relationship with Samsung. I, hey, I fixed my product, I made it last longer, I love Samsung. Yeah, occasionally they have some bugs, but they provide the information out there how to fix it. They're not afraid to allow me to fix these problems. And that creates a sense of next time it's time for me to buy my $4,000 or $2,000 TV, who am I gonna buy? Am I gonna buy from Samsung who helps provide these documentation to fix it myself? Or am I gonna provide it from XYZ company that keeps all their information proprietary and if my thing ever breaks, I can't fix it? Well, of course, you're gonna to go to the one that's more customer oriented, more friendly, more sense of purpose. And I think that's what we're going to see. We're going to see a growing movement of companies to move towards this direction. And they could also have a whole re new kinds of recycling services where you would get a big rebate on your next phone if you come with the previous one, and they could refurbish it and s do more of that, right? Absolutely. I think there's a lot of business models coming across. I was in Beijing oh, three or four months ago, and I was approached uh, by some young, some young men at a university, and they were saying, hey, I'm thinking I'd like to start up a club where we take used phones, refurbish them, and, and send them off to third world countries to provide them, you know, to have you know, connectivity and usability. And I said, hey, let's do that. And he was asking me, how do I start up this organization? Well, I mean, you can do it any way you want, and you can stay in contact with me. Of course, I can be reached always at xillia at ieee.org. I'm always available to answer any questions and help in any sort of you know, activity you want to do. You know, I, I believe there's a lot of models to make money as well as to help others. And, and, and as long as it's in the same goal, we're enabling people to help themselves in repairability and sensibility. You know, then we're doing it for the greater good.